The notification bell slightly distracted me from the overpowering pain I was feeling in my lower lady part, which was only getting severe for the past few days. I grabbed my phone and checked the message, hoping not to be him. And luckily, it wasn't. I didn't realize it had been so long. It was Nicholas, my childhood friend who suddenly went off to college one day and never contacted me again. He had sent me the pictures of Shadow and Willow. Damn, I had missed those two fur babies. Well, I miss my friend too, but not as much as these cats. What a surprise, I didn't expect a message from you. My reply was sent within a few minutes. I couldn't hide my excitement since he was one of my few friends I had stayed in high school. Well, if I were to look at it that way, he was the only one who stayed through kindergarten to high school. So, are you in Barcelona, for real? He was typing something, but before he could finish and send it, I texted again. He responded with yes while saying that he was here to stay this time. I told him the truth, that I hadn't visited his home after a few visits five years ago when I was not engaged and how much I missed playing with the two softballs. He said I could visit if I wanted, but that felt awkward considering I never visited them. What if his mom thinks I was there to seduce his son just like the women in Sebastian's family kept saying whenever I engaged greetings with any man? But his positive response put my mind at ease, and I agreed to the visit. Talking with him brought back all the things that I had missed ever since I got engaged, but now I was fed up with all of this. All my life, I had been in nothing but pain. My parents ignored my whimpers since the only thing on their minds was how to expand their business and how to overflow their already filled pockets. I clearly remember the age when I had been violated by none other than my uncle by blood. It was at the age of five, and I couldn't even understand what in the world was happening to me. All I could feel was the pain that was caused by his fingers. I still don't understand if I should cry over the malice that was directed at me or feel lucky that her wife entered the room and rushed toward me to save my life from his monstrous husband. By the way, she divorced him in the following month. After that, I started to avoid him whenever he visited our house, and even though I couldn't understand why my mother asked me to keep my mouth shut when I told her about this, now I know the real reason. It was because he was one of the major shareholders in their company. The day I realized that the sick man didn't only harass me, but also assaulted his daughter who constantly compared to me, was when she jumped down on my throat outside the school and roughed me up. As I was wailing on my own, hesitating to enter the school, I saw a boy staring in my direction, and then he started walking toward me. Are you okay? He stuttered those words, but for some reason, I started to bawl even louder. I was so embarrassed and scared that someone saw me in this state. If mom found out, she would scold me, so I ran away. Mom did scold me when I reached home thinking I picked a fight in school and I didn't correct her either. After doing me up a little bit, she informed me that she was going to visit one of her new friends who was also an investor in the company, so I was supposed to get along with her children. The moment I walked into that home, my eyes met with the same kid from earlier, and I backed away a bit fearing he would tell my mom about me crying. I'm Nicholas. I was surprised to see him smiling as he introduced himself to me as if he had met me for the first time. Thinking he might not remember our previous encounter, I smiled back and introduced myself. And as I was doing this, I did notice him stuttering for a few seconds before gaining composure. It felt good playing with him, till mom chatted with her friend. Finally, I had a friend of my own. The two of us started to grow closer as friends, since he also went to the same school as me. The day when our school asked if we wanted to enroll in the martial arts and self-defense class, I was the first one to raise my hand. From that day on, I started working hard on making myself stronger so that no one could ever harass me. I was in my third year of middle school when I first saw Sebastian, who was visiting with his father, who was to discuss something with my dad, and I immediately developed a one-sided crush on him. As time passed, my feelings for him remained the same and the day I first heard about my engagement talk with him, I fell over the moon. And judging by the way he was looking at me with excitement in his eyes, Sebastian felt the same about me. After the graduation, 
I overheard mom telling Nicholas's mom about my engagement date getting fixed, and since it was my first time hearing about it, I got embarrassed with all the same excitement as well. I got occupied with all the engagement shopping and preparation that I didn't realize Nicholas left for college until the day I visited his home with my mother to give him an invitation to the party. Just a month after the engagement, everything started to change. Sebastian started to get annoyed with me being friendly to any male, whether it was his father, cousin, or anyone. Annoyance evolved into a rage as he started screaming whenever any guy approached, whether it was my fault or not. The last time I went to visit Nicholas's mom and their cats, he called me asking where I was, and when I told him, he simply said he was on his way to pick me up. As I exited the house and approached him, something hard fell across my face, bruising my cheeks. My head turned to the side, and my eyes met with Nicholas's mother before tears filled in them. I didn't say anything, and silently got in the car. I don't know what Sebastian said to my mom that she somehow managed to convince Nicholas's mother to keep her mouth shut, but I didn't care, because I had already decided never to go there. That slap was nothing in comparison to what he started to do next. At first, I resisted him and used my skills on him to avoid his heinous actions, but he got my parents involved while threatening their partnership, so my parents asked me to stop fighting against him. I still remember my mom's words. Oh, I had put up with your father all your life, so why can't you? You're going to be his wife anyway, so why not start getting used to it beforehand? After putting up with it for almost six years now, I think it was finally enough, and I was not going to take it anymore. I had been almost a month now since my so-called fiancé Sebastian made his forceful attempt at lovemaking, yet again, and even though I did break his nose, I couldn't save myself from the pain that followed when he broke the wine bottle on that sensitive part between my legs. I couldn't handle the pain, and started to lose consciousness. But over the last few years of dealing with such behaviors of his, I had learned to fight that. As he was turning away from me while leaving me in such a state, I grabbed another wine bottle, limped toward him, and broke it on his head, which immediately made him lose consciousness. I took a deep sigh, all the while resisting the feeling of numbness taking over my brain and dragging myself out to his apartment, only to collapse while going down the stairs. I was taken to the emergency room by some residents of that apartment building and got immediate treatment. The wounds were not enough to cut the part too deep, but still, the bleeding wasn't stopping for about an hour or so, and when it finally did, the doctor stitched them. After getting discharged from the hospital, I locked myself in the room, refusing to see any of my parents or Sebastian. I knew if I were to say that I did not want to marry that monster, they would still keep forcing me so I decided to run away as soon as I got recovery. Even though my visible wounds were healing, the pain just doesn't go away, and the nightmares just won't stop where all these people force me to do things against my will. That was when I received Nicholas's text, and we decided to meet. I told him a few things about not wanting to marry Sebastian, but I never told him the reason, because I knew how he was even in school. When someone even just touched me, he would just throw insults at them, so much till they never even come closer to me. He was more like an overprotective brother to me. The next day when I entered his house, I realized no one was there besides him, so the two of us were alone. I also realized how much he had changed from that almost nerdy cute kid who always had the anger on the tip of his nose, to this handsome cheerful man who was giving off a bad boy vibe. We talked for a few moments, then he told me to head to his room till he was bringing a drink for us. After entering his room, I realized not many things had changed. That was when my gaze went to the novel I lost in the first year of high school. I picked it up and started going through pages, when I found a withered lily inside those pages. I remember giving this to him when we entered high school together, but I never realized he was still keeping it. That was when it hit me. Did he... like me? I turned my head to the door, only to find him staring at me with a slightly pleased smile that seemed barely visible. For some reason, 
my heart started thumping with the realization of his feelings for me. He handed the juice gently, and then he opened the beer can that he brought for himself. I was feeling so hot that I gulped the juice in a single breath, and as the last sip was finished, my head started to feel heavy. As I tried to look in the direction of the man standing in front of me, my vision started to get distorted. Since I had grown a little resistant to the drugs and the pain, I was able to fight it in my brain. I felt someone grabbing me and putting me somewhere. Then someone whispered something in my ear that I couldn't understand. But all of this was too terrifying to me, which intensified with the feeling of someone between my legs as a body pushed against mine, triggering back the pain caused by Sebastian. My uncle, Sebastian, and everyone who had mistreated me started to flash in front of my eyes, making my blood curdle. I tried harder to fight the effects of the drugs and was finally able to get through. As I opened my eyes and I looked at the man over me, I couldn't help but see Sebastian's face. All the pain, all the suffering he had caused started to resurface. I immediately grabbed him by his throat and flipped him over, my hands still strangling his neck. Before I could realize the man wasn't my fiance, it was too late. His breathing had already become too faint for him to get through this. I felt nothing as I saw his last breath leaving his body. No guilt, no sadness, or happiness of killing the man who was exploiting my body. I simply just sat there, staring at his lifeless body with a blank expression. I don't know how many hours passed when I heard someone screaming and calling 911 over me. My senses were still disoriented, and I could not feel anything at that point. A few moments later to the call, I saw someone putting cuffs over my hands and taking me with them. While walking outside the house, I saw mom and dad's car stopping in front of the house, and their timorous faces and voices were seen and heard by everyone. My lips formed a smile on their own, as they saw me and their expression change in a rather scared tiff. This smile on my lips was telling them, Now, you won't be able to force me to marry that weasel. Hey guys, thanks so much for all the support. If you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, please feel free to do so. I know I'm going to win no matter what today. As I said that to Carlos, he started to laugh. You know only an expert or pro player can win this game, right? He said while trying to control his laughter, for which he had started to get on my nerves now. I was never one to play games or take any sort of interest in them ever, but Carlos was the one who always used to play games, and he also was the one who introduced me to the game Minecraft saying that it was fascinating. At first, I only played it when he forced me into it, but soon after that, it started to catch my attention for being so interesting, and I started playing it on a regular basis. Carlos was my roommate and a pro player since he had always stuck his head in games, so he could win the game after a few tries. But I, on the other hand, was not able to win, so I started obsessing over it, and started to give my complete focus on the game. My sole motive was to win this game, but Carlos started to get annoyed with me. Instead of helping me with the games, he continued to mock me and make fun of me for always losing. One day, he brought over his gaming friends and asked me to play a game with them. He told me that it would be fun and that it would not be about winning or losing, so I agreed while believing his word. As we were playing, he continued winning while I continued losing. Even after several hours of playing, I could not win one single game. And when we were all having pizza and beer, Carlos along with his friends started making fun of me for being a complete newbie. I tried maintaining my cool the entire time. But as they continued making fun of me, even when his friends were leaving, I finally lost it. Hey, sorry for that man. I know my friends went a bit overboard, and as he was saying that, I hit on his head with an empty beer bottle. He stumbled as blood started dripping all over the floor, 
before he could maintain his balance, I dragged him and hit his end on his computer and continued hitting it. I guess he passed out, but I did not stop and went into the kitchen to bring a knife. Why did you say it? I'm a born loser, huh? Guess what? You won't be winning anymore either. As I said that, I continuously stabbed him in his lower waist and then chest as he stopped breathing. When my temper cooled down, I realized what I had done. I went and started playing Minecraft for some reason, and surprisingly, I won this time for the first time. I felt happy, and went ahead to grab the head of Carlos's lifeless body. I turned it toward the screen and showed him while saying, Look, I'm the winner now. Laugh if you can. As I said that, I started laughing like a maniac. After that, I realized that I had to hide Carlos's body. So I cut it into multiple pieces, wrapped it in many bags, and one by one threw it in the nearby river overnight. The next day I played again, but I lost. Thinking it must be just one lost game, I played multiple times and kept losing. So I thought of many possibilities of losing the game, and finally came up with the solution. I thought that the reason I won the game was the murder of Carlos and I had to keep killing people. The next day, I killed a stranger after following him when he was going home through a secluded area from the gaming cafe and left his body hidden in the park. I was careful not to leave any evidence that points to the murder on me. After that, I went back to my apartment and started playing the game. But after spending hours, even an entire night and day, I could not win the game. That was when I concluded that the reason for my win was to kill a pro player because that would give me the satisfaction of removing one of those pests on the face of this earth. I remembered that Carlos's friends were pro players, so I texted one of them from Carlos's number and asked him to come over to play the game. He agreed, while saying that he wanted to make fun of Carlos's loser friend with them, which made me furious. The following evening, the doorbell of my apartment rang. I knew it was him, so I went ahead and opened it. After entering the apartment, he asked me about Carlos, and I told him that Carlos was out buying drinks and edibles. He noticed that Carlos's PC wasn't there and asked me about it. As he turned toward me, I stabbed him in the chest with the knife I was already holding. I continued stabbing him till he died. After that, I went ahead logged into the game, and started playing it. As I had already concluded, I won the game. I realized that after killing a pro player, I could only win once, and if I wanted to win the game again, I had to kill the rest of Carlos's friends one by one, killing a pro player and taking my revenge as well. After killing his body in the same way that I did to Carlos's, I took out his phone and saw the contact of another friend. I recognized him by looking at the profile picture that he was also one of the people who made fun of me. Hey, let's meet at Carlos's apartment and make fun of his loser friend who never wins Minecraft. I sent the text and waited for the reply. Hell yeah, dude. I've been dying to do that. So what's the plan? He replied after 10 minutes. I'll meet you directly at his apartment, so don't be late, okay? I threw his phone on the bed after sending that text. When I was around 15, I lived alone in a two-story house. Although there were bedrooms upstairs, I would sleep on the living room couch. This was for two reasons. One, it was the central location of the house, so I could hear everything, too. It was equidistant from every exit. One night, at around two in the morning, I heard someone juggling the front doorknob. It was slow, cautious jiggle, like they were trying not to be heard. When the door didn't open, they didn't stop. The jiggling slowly became less cautious and more irritated. They persisted for at least two minutes. 
we went to the back door, which was also locked. If I didn't want to call the police, because I was an unemancipated minor living alone. I didn't want to be placed into foster care, and I didn't want my parents in trouble for neglect. Eventually, the jiggling stopped. I stayed up that night waiting for them to try other entrances, but nothing happened. A few nights passed, and I awoke to the sound of the door opening upstairs. The doors in the house would really stick, so they took a lot of force to open. When you popped them loose, they'd make a loud scrape pop and shudder noise. At the time, I would take sleeping pills. It made it really hard to fully awaken, and I'd sometimes only awaken with sleep paralysis. I couldn't determine whether I dreamt the sound or whether I woken up from it. I started to fall back asleep and thought I heard the door close like grinding of wood rubbing together. Then the sound of bed springs screeching like weights were being shifted. I thought, maybe someone is homeless and they thought this was an abandoned house. I was super tired and wasn't sure if I was actually conscious. I fell back asleep and awoke to the feeling of somebody watching me. There were stairs parallel to the living room door, and I could see them from the couch. Halfway down the stairwell, I could see a long-haired man, crouched over, looking at me. It was dark, and I felt like we were both trying to verify what we were seeing. I kept a metal baseball bat by the couch and grabbed it. Slowly, the man erected his body and without turning backed up the stairs. I just listened for him to leave, or waited for him to come back down. But I heard neither. It was like he just stood at the top of the stairs, waiting for me. I didn't go back to sleep. I heard nothing, even until sunrise. When I left for school that morning, that question what I'd actually experienced I had my boyfriend over later that evening. As we approached the house, he said, Hey, your windows are open. I looked in the room to the sticking door was wide open. I told him what I'd experienced the night before, and he helped me check out the house. After finding nothing, I enclosed and locked the windows. I figured it must have been a hobo. Once they realized somebody lived there, they left. I still stayed there that night, but I didn't take sleeping pills. I woke to the door opening again. This time, I knew it was real. They knew somebody lived there, but they still returned. At this time of my life, I had little value for my life. I had no fear of death because I knew where I'd go. I decided that I wasn't going to hide in my own house. I got my baseball bat, turned on the lights, and went upstairs. I yelled something like, Listen, buddy, I'm coming up. Be out by the time I get there. I heard nothing and prepared for the worst. I checked the rooms and the closets, but I found nothing, and the windows were still open. I checked the downstairs and found nothing as well. I felt pretty silly after finding nothing, but still stayed up that night. I got ready for school the next morning and saw that the window was open again. It occurred to me that I hadn't checked under the beds when I'd done the search. I didn't have my bat with me and bailed. To think that intruder was possibly hiding under the bed as I searched the house is spooky but I'm partially relieved that I hadn't checked. If I'd been down and come face to face with the man beneath my bed, the story may have ended differently. This story takes place two years ago when I was living in the same house as my two younger sisters and my father. We lived in a neighborhood that wasn't necessarily unsafe, but wasn't the best neighborhood for people to live in. 
I can recall some neighbors getting arrested for dealing when I was maybe five, but the story isn't about them. In the summer of 2018, my sisters and I would stay up late into the night, sometimes only going to bed after the sun had risen. I was 17 and my sisters were 15 and 13. My father would go to bed early as he was a responsible adult. To explain the situation best, I need to describe what my house looked like. It was a one-story home with four doors on the front of my house, three of which opened to our living room and one of which opened to the, my bedroom. Our backyard fence had been knocked down by a storm recently, and we had two doors on the back of the house, one that opened to the kitchen and one that opened to my father's room. One night at around 12.30 a.m., I was doing what I usually did. I was listening to scary stories on my phone as I made art on my iPad. I didn't use earbuds because I've always been paranoid that something might happen while I'm using them. My sisters, who shared a room down the hall from me, were doing whatever they did at night. It didn't really concern me. My father was fast asleep in his room. Now, I don't know about all of you, but I always end up very on edge when I'm listening to scary stories, so I'm hyper aware of what's going on around me. You can imagine how hard I jumped when I heard a sharp pounding on our front door. Four hard thuds could be heard throughout the house and I could hear the front door shake with the strength of each knock. I checked the time, terrified. It was 1am. I held my breath, hoping to God that I'd heard wrong. I really didn't want to think someone was at my front door. At this moment, my middle sister Jen came running to my room, trying to keep her step silent. She looked at me, eyes wild. You heard that too, right? She asked, voice trembling. I swallowed and nodded, heart pounding in my chest. We need to go wake Dad up. I responded and started towards my father's bedroom. Julia followed diligently behind me. On her way to our dad's room, my youngest sister, Ness, peeked her head out from her room. She too looked scared. I opened my dad's door and shook him awake, trembling slightly. One of my worst fears is someone breaking into our house. Dad, someone's at the front door. Even as I said this, I felt sick. What? Dad whispered, groggy and not at all happy that we had woken him. There's someone here, Jen whispered. I heard it. Someone knocked on the door. I nodded all too eagerly. My dad slowly got out of bed. He knew that my sisters and I always jumped to the worst conclusions whenever anything happened, so he assumed we were doing the same here. I watched silently as he went to the front door, my stomach leaping to my throat. There's no one out there, he told my sisters and I, absolutely unimpressed as he looked through the blinds. My heart sank a little. I kind of started to doubt myself, but my sisters had heard the knocking too, so I knew I wasn't alone in this. I tried to reason with him before he went back to bed, but he didn't believe us, too scared to really care what we were saying. Dejected but scared, I ended up taking my mattress off my bed and sleeping in my sister's room for the night, taking a baseball bat and lying it next to my mattress. My overactive imagination had me thinking that whoever was at the door was out to kill us, and I knew I have to defend my younger sisters against any danger that dared enter our house. The next day passed just fine. My sisters and I knew we had heard something and our dad brushed off our attempts to explain it. He thought we were sleep deprived or perhaps that a large bug had hit our door. That explanation I had frowned at. It wasn't until 11pm that night when my father was lounging on one of the couches in the living room that we heard the pounding again. Only this time it was much more aggressive and directly on the door behind my father. My father let out a loud frustrated scream and charged toward the front door. I had been standing in the living room when the pounding occurred again and my sisters had rushed to stand next to me after hearing my father shout. We were all shaken. Our father never yelled like that. I started to cry as my father went to rush outside and confront whoever was out there. I begged him not to go outside in case he were to get hurt. He told my sisters and I to call the cops and he cursed some more when he realized that whoever had knocked on the door was now gone. My sisters called the cops and they arrived fairly quickly, talking with my dad about what was going on, 
claiming that there had been other complaints about this happening and explaining that they would try their best to find out who was doing this. The police did a search around her house but didn't find anyone, even searching the backyard where I was afraid the perpetrator might be. The police assured us that someone would patrol the neighborhood that night. Once the cops were gone, my dad apologized for not believing us the night before. We said it was okay and left it at that. He locked all of the doors and stayed up later than my sisters and I. I couldn't calm down, so I slept in my sister's room that night as well. Eventually though, I put this situation behind me. A few months had passed, but not without nightmares and sleep paralysis about the whole ordeal. Most nightmares ended with someone breaking in and hurting my sisters. Other nightmares ended in more brutal ways. I thought nothing more of the whole ordeal. This is until one day I came home from school and Ness ran up to me, buzzing with energy. She proceeded to tell me that apparently the cops had found out who was knocking on everyone's door about a month or so ago. It was some older guy who lived a few houses down from us. They had gotten him to stop and I'm not sure if he was given a warning or something. He was a little unstable mentally and nobody had ever opened their doors for him. Ness then told me that the same guy had been arrested earlier this day. I was shocked. He'd only been knocking on people's doors at odd hours of the night. I asked her why he'd been arrested. He shot and killed 15 people one town over. She responded. I couldn't believe it. But my father later confirmed this story. I'm happy to say that he is in jail and no longer lives in that neighborhood. I haven't done any more looking into his crime other than trying to confirm it for myself the day he was arrested. I am also happy to say that after another recent event where someone tried to break into our house, my father installed a ring doorbell, the doorbell with the camera which gave my sisters and I some comfort. I hope this man gets what he deserves, or maybe that he gets the help he needs if he really truly is completely insane. I also hope that the families affected by this man's actions are able to find some form of closure in knowing that he's locked away 